beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, if, if you did pray that prayer with Pastor Tanya before you leave sometime today, and this is a lot of times at the end, well, all the time at the end of the service, I just make the comment that you need to tell somebody. If you prayed that prayer, you need to tell somebody. It's very important that you tell somebody because it seals it. it. It does something unique. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. So it's, it's vital that you do this. So when everybody else is leaving, you just come down. I'll be down here in the front. You say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. And that'll be wonderful. Or any other thing that I can help you with or, or be, a, be of any uh, help to you at that time. All right? All right. We are starting a new series today. <clears throat> this is a series about following Jesus. Now, that's a very easy phrase to say. <laughs> I want to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, let me just read. Uh, I, I don't do this very often, but let me just read the opening paragraph that I wrote on your notes. If you, if you get the notes, if you get the handout, uh, this, is, uh, this is what it, it says, and, and I'm just going to use it as an introduction so we can just jump right into John 4. This is a series about following Jesus. When you hear that phrase, how do you respond? If you're like most, you give a hearty amen, brother. But sadly, that's about as far as it goes. Jesus declared, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When he spoke this, 12 young men did follow him. The Bible does not tell us how old they were, but most biblical historians estimate their ages to be between 15 and 30, with Peter being the oldest and John most likely being the youngest. These young men became his disciples. For approximately three and a half years, they followed Jesus everywhere. They became the pioneer builders of the church and earned the moniker Christian when the citizens of Antioch decided that was the only appropriate name to call them, Little Christ. Their life goal was simple. Wake up and follow Jesus wherever he went. So this is our heritage. Go where he goes. Stay where he stays. Eat when he eats. Pray when he prays. Say what he says. Our life is not easy, but it is simple follow him. The only fly in the ointment is that Jesus is now invisible. The disciples had the luxury of physically seeing his footprints, but for us, it's as the apostle Paul exclaims, the just shall live by faith. So by faith, we see into the unseen and we follow this invisible yet ever-present Jesus. Follow me, Jesus says. One of the things that I believe the church has failed in in its, in its 2,000 years or so of existence since Christ is that it has done almost anything but follow Jesus. It has plans, it has, uh, it has uh, publicities, it has uh, uh, pledges, it has... Um, meetings, it has, it, it, it has directions, it has goals. I mean, it has everything except the one simple thing that Jesus asked of us, and that is to follow him. I guess it's because we think we have a better idea. We have a better plan. Let's, let's don't make it simple. I mean, where you have a mentor leading a group of people that are leadable, that are noticeable, that are small enough to be, to be observed and to be held accountable for what's going on and to be helped individually to show them, to, to teach them, to train them, like Jesus did for three and a half years. Those guys went everywhere with Jesus. They did everything with Jesus. When Jesus moved, they moved. 
When he slept, they slept. When he prayed, they prayed. And they did that for three and a half years. And they became the, the, the foundation of everything that we know today as the church. By 12 men, and one of them was a devil, just from learning and following Jesus, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. But we have buildings and we have budgets and we have campuses. We have ministries, 30,000 people, one pastor. That's a better idea, don't you think? It makes uses of resources in a much better way. There's only one thing about that. It doesn't produce disciples. It produces religious people. It produces not Christians. But are they really challenged to be what Jesus said we were to be and to do what Jesus commanded us to do? Is it possible that after 2,000 years there are more lost people on this world than there ever has been? Because we have a better way. Let's group everybody together and have big groups and let one person just kind of throw it at them. If there had been a better way, I submit to you that Jesus would have done it that way. The way he did it is the way he wanted it done and it's the best. And, and so uh, for the next few weeks, I, I want to just show you what Jesus actually did. You know, we read all kind of books about uh, personal growth, church growth, uh, building the kingdom, um, all kinds of titles and so forth about how to do what we should as a Christian. The only thing we don't do most of the time is just simply read the Bible and see what he did and then do what he did. Because if there was a better way, he would have done it a better way. But he did it a certain way and it's really very simple to see once you start reading exactly what Jesus did. It's not easy, <laughs> but it's simple. And we're gonna to look today, we're gonna to start with the, one of the probably most familiar stories in, in the life of Jesus. Everybody's heard about the woman at the well, the desperate housewife <laughs> that Jesus meets one day. But this, but this account is full of guidance about what it means to follow Jesus and what you can expect if you do follow Jesus. This is, this is really just amazing. Beginning at verse one, John four, verse one. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. All right, evidently the Pharisees were keeping score. Yeah. And when Jesus heard that it had been reported to the Pharisees that he was baptizing more people than John was, like there was a contest, Jesus did the exact opposite of that. Jesus did not try to put himself in competition with John the Baptist or anybody else. But the Pharisees wanted to make a, a, a contest out of this thing. So when Jesus hears this, the Bible says that uh, they probably posted it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, Snapchat. Verse two, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, so Jesus never baptized anybody, only his disciples did it. Verse three, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. The old King James said, like, and, and he must needs go through Samaria. That's a good little bounce. In other words, Jesus was going from Judea, and I'll put a map up in a few minutes, Judea to Galilee, and between them was Samaria a place where Jews never went, by the way. No self-respecting Jew would be caught dead in Samaria, but Jesus says, hey, we're going up to Galilee, guys. Come on, 
Oh, and, and we, we're going through Samaria. I need, I need to go through Samaria. Okay. Woo. Woo. Anxiety just pops all out. Verse five. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. This is, by the way, a big controversy. A lot of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans dealt with stuff like this, this Jacob's well stuff, and other religious issues. I mean, they, they were both the same nationalities, both the same race of people. So it wasn't racial issues. It, it, it was religious issues and cultural issues. They, each one thought they were the best. But, but anyway, that, so now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, now, now pay attention to, the, to this. And I, did I underline it? Oh, yeah, I did. Being wearied. So why did Jesus stop at the well? Because he was tired, right? He's weary. And Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which means 12 noon. It's high noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples, this is, notice this also, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Yeah, it's about 100 feet deep. Deep, deep well. Still there, by the way. Marvelous well, deep water. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? <laughs> she's already being combative, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, she, 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 you can see she's stirring around for some kind of a ruffle here, I guess. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you're now with is not your husband, and that you, in that you spoke truly. There, there, there's the desperate in the desperate housewife. Verse 19, the woman said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> News flashing. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. This is Mount Gerizim, by the way, if you're a, you know, if you like geography. And, and Mount Gerizim is where the Samaritans thought the temple should be built. That was another problem they had. The Jews said Jerusalem was where the temple should be built. The Samaritans said Mount Gerizim is where the temple should be built. So there you go, thus conflict. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, and we, what we, and we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. In other words, we've been debating about worship. Let's just agree to disagree. And when the Messiah comes, he'll straighten it all out. And Jesus said to her, <laughs> newsflash, I who speak to you am he. And then something happens 
that certainly has to be a setup. And, and we're gonna talk about this. This next event is just dramatic staging. It is just unbelievable, um, uh, good, good staging, good drama. Verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled. That's a nice word for being disgusted. That he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Because they were all chicken. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So let's see if we can get some truth out of this about following Jesus. How many of you guys work out, by the way, just interested? How, many, how, how often do you work? You work out every day? You work out? I may not look like it, but I used to work out uh, quite a bit. I probably look like somebody that used to work out. I worked out for like 25 years, 30 years. I used to be in shape. I used to be strong and all that kind of stuff. Now I'm just a little old. But while I was working out, I ran in to, I grouped people into a couple of mentalities about staying fit. W one group of people worked out consistently so that they could basically eat whatever they wanted to eat and still stay fit. This is what I called uh, playing to tie. Work out enough to overcome what you ate and do that all the time and stay in shape and stay fit because you really want to eat anything you want to eat and you, but you don't want to get overweight. The second mentality of people about staying fit are the kind of people that don't want to eat anything so they don't have to work out. Because they hate working out so much that they would rather not eat than to have to work out after they ate. And their motto basically is avoid pain at all cost. Now, my point here is do you avoid things because they're painful. If you do, you are my, like most human beings. Some people can somehow see the, the good in painful things, but not very many. And that's a shame because pain can be very useful in life. As a matter of fact, I would say if you would examine your life, that you would say, I have grown, I have learned more from pain than I have when I've been at ease. Most of the time you learn, I don't want to ever do that again. <laughs> you know? I mean, but you learn and you mature because of pain. Well, is it possible to become like Jesus? Is it, is it, is it possible to follow Jesus and to become like Jesus without pain? Uh, maybe some, in some fantasy land somewhere, but not in the reality of life. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not promoting pain. I'm not a masochist, so I, I, I don't like pain. And I try to avoid pain at all costs. I don't like to wear pain as a merit badge. Some people do. Some people can't be happy unless they're miserable and they wear their pain on as a merit badge and I'm not promoting that kind of thing. All, all I'm trying to say to you is this. If you are going to follow Jesus, get ready to lean into some pain because following Jesus is not nearly as safe as you have been led to believe. He does things on purpose that just hurt. <laughs> it's all it pulls down to it. Maybe not physically, but it, it hurts. Here in John 4, we have a whole people group that 
are avoiding a, a geographic location. The Jews and the Samaritans are, are bitter enemies. The Jews consider the Samaritans to be mixed breeds. The Jews think they're count, the Jews think the Samaritans are counterfeit Jews. The Samaritans have their own Bible. It's the same Bible that Israel has. The first five books called the books of Moses, the book of law. Both of them, they have the same Bible, but they obviously look at it in a different way. One has a temple, one wants a temple. It, it, they're just a lot of cultural conflict. They're the same race, they're the same people, they came from the same ancestors. The 12 tribes of Israel, all of them came from the 12 tribes of Israel. And yet, here they are, with bigotry and, and racism and hypocrisy. That sounds pretty current, doesn't it? <laughs> so severe that, put my map up, I think it's the next slide. That so severe that to go from Jerusalem, this is Judea, the green's Judea, the beige is Samaria, and the top green is Galilee. To go from Jerusalem right down here to Galilee, which is, there's Nazareth, and I think you can see all that. The red line, that's, that, that's, that's 70 miles. It takes about two and a half days to walk from down there to up there. But they hated each other so much that they would not go the short route. They went the yellow route. You see it? You have to go out from Jerusalem across the Jordan River, up the side of the Jordan River, what's called Transjordan now, go all the way up past the Sea of Galilee so that you can cross back over it like Bethsaida or one of those areas up there. 140 miles, twice the distance, simply to keep from stepping foot in Samaria. The Jews thought that if somehow they put their foot in Samaria, they would get possessed by a demon. They thought that it would be, you know, you'd catch leprosy or have some horrible thing happen to you if you allowed yourself to go through Samaria. So no, self, no, no, no self-respecting Jew would ever even suggest going through that wicked, horrible place. But here's Jesus, and I'll just remind you that Jesus was a Jew, and all of his disciples were Jews. They were all brought up in the same culture. They were all taught the same cultural standards and cultural rules. So Jesus very much knew what it meant when he said to them, hey guys, we're going up to Galilee, and uh, this time we're going through Samaria. Because I, I, I have a need to go through Samaria. Well, I'm not sure that Jesus had to go through Samaria. I, I think what Jesus is saying is, I, I feel that it is imperative that I drag you 12 Jewish young men who are the progenitors of the kingdom the whole kingdom of God is, going, is riding on these guys. Jesus is not going to be around but, but a, a few more years from now. If the kingdom is going to be built, it's going to be built by these 12 young men right here who won't go through Samaria. So I got to bring them through Samaria because we've got to crush this bigotry, this racism, and this hatred that they have and I've got to teach them some things about how to view life and how to, how to understand my mission and, and what, what I desire for them. So he starts walking towards Samaria. I'm not sure what, the, what the, the, the conversation was while they were walking. I mean, he's, he's got a gang with him, basically. He's got a gaggle. He's 12 guys and Jesus, 13 guys. And remember, I was talking with Pastor Tanya about this last night, and I was trying to imagine it. These are all teenagers. Most of them are about 15, 16 years old. Peter's maybe, maybe in his early 20s, maybe. 
But the rest of them are young teenage boys. So here you got this teenage gang, you know, <laughs> walking down the street everywhere they go. And I'm thinking, and you know, when you get a bunch of teenage boys together, that, that can be trouble. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. No matter what race or whatever, they, you, get, you get 12 teenage boys together and I would just, you know, you just need to be careful because they, they can think of things uh, that are just craziness, you know. But anyway, so here they are walking towards Samaria and I can't imagine what they're thinking. They ha I don't know if they say anything to Jesus, but they had to be thinking to each other, where in the world is he taking us? Does he know where this road goes? Do you think he knows what he's doing? Why is he doing this? I mean, I can just hear them talking to each other. They're just, they're just puzzled by this. So he goes across the Samaria borderline and they step across the borderline and it's like, we're in Samaria, we're in Samaria, oh, we're in Samaria. And not only that, he keeps walking and he comes to the first city, which is Sychar where Jacob's well is. And, and he doesn't stop at the city limits. He walks right straight into the middle of town. Right. Can, you, can you imagine the Samaritans seeing this gang of Jews walking down the street? Can you, can you imagine what they're thinking when they see them? What are those boys up to? Yeah. Oh, man, we better lock the doors, get the women inside. You know, I mean, they're, they're, the Samaritans are just as anxious as the Jews would be about this. And he walks them right straight to the middle of, of the town. I mean, you, you can feel the tension, really. I mean, it's just... And so they're looking around and they're saying, when are we going to stop? And where are we going to go? Jesus, I think we missed our turn back there somewhere we we're in the wrong place and it's 12 o'clock noon and jesus walks over there it's hot and he sits down on that well and then he tells them okay boys go buy some food they're gonna have to go and walk out in that town without Jesus, just those 12 boys, down the city streets, maybe into a marketplace. Maybe they even had to stop at houses or something to try to buy food. Well, you know the Samaritans didn't want to sell them anything. I mean, they, I mean probably, how many times do you think they got spit on while they were walking? Or somebody just in disgust, uh, what are you boys doing here? Get out of here. You ain't not deserve here. No, we ain't selling you nothing. Starve to death. I don't care. I mean, the attitudes. And they certainly didn't want to give the Samaritans any of their money. So they had to buy some food from people that didn't want to sell it, even though they didn't really want to buy it either. But they had to bring something back to Jesus because Jesus sent them on a mission. Well, while they are gone, a woman of Samaria comes out to the well at noon because let's just say uh, she probably doesn't have the best reputation. And she comes at noon because nobody is ever at the well at noon. And nobody's going to see her, talk to her, and she wants to just get her stuff and get out of there. But here's this Jew sitting on the well. And she comes up to Jesus at the well. And the disciples are, are now gone and and she begins to talk to well jesus starts the conversation uh can can i can you get me a, a drink of water because see he doesn't have a bucket or anything he's just sitting there can you get me a drink of water and the conversation starts going well while the conversation's going they're out the boys are out looking for everything because jesus this horrible this, this cruel master sent them on a mission. How, how crude and rude and, 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 and unfortunate it is that they had to be out there in that kind of an environment 
without Jesus, and they're out there trying to get all of their stuff. How uncomfortable are, would that be? You mean Jesus is willing to make us uncomfortable in order to, to do something in our life? You know, most people, honestly, most people think just the opposite of that. If things start getting uncomfortable in your life, many times you think it's because you're doing something wrong. So you start looking for a way to stop doing that because if you were doing it right, man, you would be on the jet stream with Jesus. You know, it would be wonderful. You could be like on a magic carpet ride. No, it's just the opposite. If you're doing something for Jesus, most of the time it's going to be uncomfortable. Because the truth is, he loves to walk us straight into things that, we're, that we've been trying to avoid all of our life. And at all costs. And he walks us right straight into it. He has the conversation with her. He wins her over. At the end of the conversation, he says, if, if you would have known, you could have asked me and I would have given you this living water. And she, said, and she says, well, you know, give, Lord, give it to me. And then he says, go get your husband. And he says, I don't have one. And then that conversation. And, and it is at that precise moment when she looks at him and says, how do I, I you are such a wonderful man. You are so pleasant. You seem to have such a loving nature about yourself. And you're so brilliant, and it just seems, and, and you're the Messiah. And, and, and I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to have what you have. She's right at the point of surrendering herself to the Messiah. And things go from bad to worse. Because it is at this precise moment, and this is why I said it had to be a setup, that those, that that gang of Jewish boys <laughs> come back to the well. At this precise moment, the invitation is being given. She's walking down the aisle to be saved. And stage right, 12 racist bigots walk up and they don't say anything. But I will guarantee you it, everything they thought was written on their face. Because when they left, she, she wasn't there. When they left, Jesus was by himself, which was bad enough. But now when they come back and they're coming down the road, you know, they can see uh, somebody's at the well with Jesus, right? Yeah. Who is it? And they just keep on walking. And they get a little closer and they said, is, is that a woman? And then they w keep on walking. And yeah, that is a woman. And that's not even a good woman. That, that's, that, that woman looks like she's kind of, you know, uh, a little uh, colored. Uh, not racist, but, you know, her past and so forth. Yeah, I was trying to stay away from some words. Um, and so, I guarantee you their faces were like, squinty eyed and they didn't say a word but they walk up and when they walk up the woman gets scared because she can see them and they are conveying a message to her by the faces and they don't say a word. They don't ask Jesus, uh, why are you doing this? What's going on? Uh, it's like, hey, Jesus, what's good? <laughs> you know, oh, what? it's all good. It's all good. It, uh, uh, nice day here in uh, Samaria. <laughs> and she sees them and she drops her bucket. This is, this is why I say she was afraid. She drops her bucket what is the only 
piece of equipment she has that she has to have in order to survive in that town, a bucket. She leaves her, her, her only, her only uh, tool for getting the water out of this deep well. She just drops it and takes off to go find the men. What? I got to find the men because this gang back here just walked up with hatred in their eyes and disgust on their face, and I don't think they're up to any good, and it looks like there may be trouble, trouble so let me get the men back down here because they need to take care of these boys. And Jesus is sitting on the well, and the boys, while she's gone, the boys say, as a matter of fact, I think, look at the next verse. Yeah, here it is. And then they went out of the city and came to him, the men. All the men start coming to Jesus. In the meantime, in the meantime, now this is why I told you that Jesus set all this up because it's gonna, we're going to prove it right now. In the, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat, eat. You sent us on a mission to go get some food, Right? So you were hungry. You wanted some food. But the scripture doesn't say they were hungry. The scripture says he was tired. It didn't say he was hungry. But he sent them to get food. So the implication to them was the master's ready to eat. So while the woman left and, and everything was happening, coming back and so forth, the men and all were coming back out there, the disciples said, hey, while we got a minute, here, master, we, we, we finally got something to eat. And then he says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? <laughs> John, did you give him a chicken leg or something? I mean, what? he said he's not hungry. Did you do this? And they don't understand. But Jesus, see, Jesus just sent them out because they needed to experience what they experienced on both ends. And the woman at the well needed to experience what she experienced. So it was a win-win, which is the way things happen with God. A win-win. She got saved and their city got touched and saved and the disciples were never again like this. So let me give you, just quickly, three observations that reveal the truth about following Jesus. And y'all relax, because I've already preached most of what I'm gonna say to you. Just to give you the points. You know, every message has to have some points, right? At least one. This one has, of course, three, because it's from God. First observation. Following Jesus requires you to face issues that you would rather avoid. If you're gonna follow Jesus, you're not going to be able to avoid the difficult or the painful because Jesus is going to run you into all of those things that you've put on the back burner of your life and you somehow uh, want to avoid. One example, one example that we all can identify with, uh, segregation. You know, the most segregated hour of the week is still Sunday morning at 11. After all these years. Because we just don't mix. Why don't we? Well, we have all kind of reasons. But it's still the issue. And we would rather avoid that than to try to do anything to constructively change it. And we've tried it all of our life. I mean, as a matter of fact, right now, we have a whole group, I'm sure inspired by the enemy, that's trying to push us back into attitudes that we left 50 years ago. And they're trying to bring them back. Like, you know, everything's about race. Everything's about uh, poor and rich and culture. And I mean, we left that stuff. I remember when I was in the eighth grade, we desegregated in Mississippi. And we've been that, and I'm 65 years old, but now, now it seems like we're getting pushed back or they want to push us back. But this dear woman seems to indicate that she loves Jesus. Give me Jesus. 
I want Jesus, but I'm afraid of his followers. When they come back, she leaves. So following Jesus means that you have to go through Samaria. Look at this verse. This is Acts 1.8. This is a commission verse. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, which are the cities, and in all Judea and Samaria, which are regions, and even to the ends of the earth. That's our mission. Our mission is that wherever he would send us, that's where we're going to have to go. So we can't avoid anything because just as soon as we try to avoid it, it's going to be necessary for us to follow Jesus. And Jesus is going to walk us right into that, which was uncomfortable. Observation number two. Following Jesus requires walking toward things that you may not understand. Let me just put it in a nutshell to say it this way. The essence of religion is to think that everything you need to know, you know. And that everything you need to understand, you understand. And that and that, the, that in the case of spiritual issues, the book is closed. That is the essence of religion. It's our way. We have it all. It's not going to change. And if you don't believe like us, then you are out. Now, the Bible is a closed book. In other words, it's not still being added to. It is, it is truth, and it is stable, and it is settled, and it is finished. The Bible is. But our understanding of the Bible is still changing. I've been with the Lord. Uh, I've been preaching for 47 years. That means about, I've been close to 50 years. Right at 50 years of my life, I've been with the Lord. And I can't tell you how many things have changed in my life about what I believe over 50 years. The Bible is still the same Bible. It is still the same Word of God, but my understanding of it is constantly being refined by Jesus. And so if we follow him, one of the things that we're going to have to, to, to contend with is that there are going to be many things that we don't understand. But if you'll go with him, he'll show you things. It's like the further we go, the more he shows us. So walking with Jesus is not comfortable because you're constantly having to shift. You know what I think one of the, one of the worst things you can do in life, period, not just talking about church, in Christianity, but just in, in general, anything in life, paint yourself in a corner. You know, use words. I'll never do that. It'll never be that way. That won't ever happen to me. You know, stuff like that, using these kind of phrases. Because most likely it is going to, going to happen to you. It's going to change, and it's going to be something... But you've said something now, and so you've just about forced yourself not to be able to change because you've, your words have painted you into a corner. Just try to stay away from words like that. And don't ever say, my children will never do. Just don't ever say anything like that because that's, sure, that's a sure giveaway that that's exactly what's going to happen with them almost every time. All right, let me give you observation number three. I've started meddling now, so let me just move on. Observation number three. Following Jesus requires you to expand your understanding of God's love. Nutshell, God loves, tr I'm looking for a word to, to describe it, loves in such a tremendous way that we can't grasp how much God loves. If we're going to follow Jesus, we are going to have to expand our ability to see the vastness of God's love. Because you, you mean God loves Samaritans? 
Come on, Jesus. God doesn't love Samaritans. Nasty, reprobate jokers. Yeah, God loves Samaritans. He loves sinners. You know, the, the thing is, we think God loves us because he has a reason to love us. Look at us. Who wouldn't love us? But those nasty vermin out there, no. Those people that do evil things, those people that do vile things, he, he couldn't love them. He loves them as much as he loves you. That is an understanding. And if you're gonna follow Jesus, that's going to be challenging for you to grasp that God loves us and that God is for us and that he will provide for us and, and, and lead us and guide us and he will do the same for them. Nobody's ever out with God because God loves in such a vast, tremendous way. See these guys, yes, yeah, Grace. See these guys before they took this little trip through Samaria? They would have never thought of a Samaritan receiving the Messiah. I mean, this is, would just be beyond their imagination. But Jesus drags them right straight up into it and shows them what God does with people that they can't stand. To think that God could love your worst enemy is an amazing thing. But it's the vastness of God's love. All right. All right. So let's bow our heads just for a moment. 